All right, everyone. Welcome back to our last talk of this Saturday, day one of our fourth annual Taoist Gate Conference. Our next presenter is your favorite astrologer's favorite astrologer. In her practice, aptly named Tiger Eye Astrology, she offers readings, astromantic forecasts, meditations, and classes. Through Bodza chart readings and I Ching divination, her work helps patients with change and choice, harmonizing and integrating changes that have happened and how to initiate change when it is needed. A student of masters such as Zhong Xian Wu, Lindsay Wei, and Deng Ming Dao, Meng is a full-time artist whose public art installations are heavily influenced by her Taoist practice and training. Chinese astrology is a subject that always sparks a lot of interest in our community, uh, perhaps for a couple of reasons. One, it tends to be right, or it tends to really help us frame some of the major events that are happening in our world at any given time. For example, something as big as the pandemic uh, fits in perfectly with some of the understandings of yearly cycles, and also understanding even the weather, even the patterns of climate on faraway places across the globe, um, which is really amazing. I'm certainly not the only one who saw their uh, life kind of flipped upside down in this dragon year. So I'd love to hear more about how we're going to transition from the dragon year up until the snake year coming up. Another really important thing about Chinese astrology is it helps us to contextualize and locate ourselves within the circular patterns of space and time. With Chinese culture's impressive ability to find patterns and organize our perception of reality on full display. In this talk, we're going to explore the animist and shamanic roots of Chinese astrology and how it applies to our modern world. As we move from a yang wood dragon year to a yin wood snake, I'm going to use her words um, from the talk. And as we explore how these views can help us navigate the dynamics of polarization and em embrace greater pluralism in our lives providing spiritual stability in times of polycrisis. I love that last part. Lastly, since I never met her before, uh, I asked a friend for help with the intro who asked another friend, uh, who I believe is either a friend or student or perhaps both. And I think this quote does more justice than I could. Uh, so I'm just gonna read it. Meng is mega smart and walks her path with utmost care and respect for Taoist philosophy and the cosmos. She lives life artfully and creates from a place of deep communion with it with the elements. Whether it's making paper, natural inks, dancing Chinese folk dance, or listening to land and how it wants to be shaped to support love and life, her friends all have big crushes on her. And so I'm gonna turn it over to Yuha Meng. Thank you, Sam. Um, thank you for that really great introduction and that very sweet testimony. Um, it's really wonderful to feel the presence of my community and, and my friends um, here. And um, I just wanna thank you also for the invitation to present here today. Um, I would also like to thank Master Zhou for hosting this Taoist conference. This is um, truly a special gathering of practitioners and teachers and I'm very honored to be here. Um, I'd also just always like to start by acknowledging and thanking my teachers, specifically Master Zhongshen Wu for initiating my journey into the Taoist wisdom traditions. And as you've already mentioned, I've had many teachers since then, some of whom have been previous speakers at this conference. Um, too many to name, name them all here, but um, as Sam mentioned, I am a practitioner of Chinese astromantic arts. I've been offering I Ching and Bodzi chart consultations for over the last 12 years. And Sam, when he reached out about the theme of this conference, uh, the application of ancient wisdom to modern times, modern problems. Um, I really you know, thought to myself, how do I actually explain what it is that I do as a practitioner of the astromantic arts? You know, when people reach out to me about their modern problems, how exactly does divination and astrology help them? 
you know, these traditions that have their roots dating back to oracle bones and scapulomancy dating from Neolithic times? You know, how do they actually end up providing guidance and insight to people of the 21st century? Well, the tradition of divination and astrology is the study of time. The bridge that links the ancient and the modern is the astromantic question of what time is it? You know, systems of astrology and divination were developed by our human ancestors through their observations of cycles and patterns in nature over thousands of years. So today, every inquiry that comes to me, whether the person is focused on their career or their family or their relationships, every inquiry is essentially asking, what time is it? Is it the right time? Is it a good time? Is it the time for this or the time for that? Am I on time? Am I too late? Will this be time wasted or time well spent? So I'm going to share my screen here. Can everybody see this image? Okay, great. So when we look at images of yin and yang, the five elements, the 12 animals, the solar terms. These are all Chinese clocks. They, these are ways of reading time. And what do they all have in common? You're seeing them, what do they all share? It's the circle, exactly, yeah. So according to the Chinese worldview, the shape of time is circular. It's round. And this means that there is neither linearity nor a sense of finitude. There's no evolution or improvement, a sense of you know, movement towards progress. There's always notably a return. There's also no beginning or end. There's always a response. You know, what comes up must come down, what swings left must swing right, what goes out will come back in. In a circle, which direction is up? Well, that depends on where you stand. It depends on your positionality. In the circle, the whole and the particular are always in dynamic conversation. The circle shows us everything is included. All things carry the possibility of their opposite. Everything depends on context. There's always a call and response and everything is shared through responsiveness to each other. So what can Chinese astrology tell us about the time we're in? collectively. My theme today is about the transition from young wood dragon to yin wood snake. We are already past the height of the dragon year, which occurred during Xia Zi, the summer solstice. So yang is falling, yin is returning. The dragon has already been retreating. And my demonstration of my skills, which I was also prompted by Sam to do, is going to be me sharing my prognostication for the snake year. So you'll have to wait till 2025 to figure out if I'm actually skilled or not. <laughs> but before we start diving into this topic of dragon and snake, we need to understand the worldview that this tradition comes from. So we know how it was meant to be practiced. And we can't do this without diving into a little bit of a history lesson. Chinese astrology as a whole has over a dozen different 
forms, a dozen different modalities. And even with advanced mathematics, astronomy, calculations developed from before the common era, if you are a practitioner of this tradition, you are the first to admit that we don't really know what is going on here. And most likely we never will. Which means that there is an art to it. There's always room for play. The Chinese science in its various disciplines doesn't attempt to breed arrogance. Our cosmology always has, I don't know, as the basis of our experience. But the source is always Huin you know, And in this Huin Duin Tang, this chaos soup, where everything flavors everything else, you know, there is no beginning or end, no differentiation you will never be able to grasp all the cofactors, all the streams of cause and effect. So what you don't know is always far more profound than what you think you know. So there's always room to wonder, to play. But there's no sense of completion here. We will never arrive at anything definitive. You know, at best, what we can be is artistic, you know, like cooking, making what we can given the ingredients that we have. But this is, there's an art to this. And the first formalized system of Chinese natal astrology was the Bazi, and practiced and adopted by the imperial government documented in the Han Dynasty. And during the formulation of the Han, there was much debate about the form of governance and techniques of statecraft that would be most effective and long lasting. Would it replicate the highly centralized government of the Qing that preceded it? You know, the Qing state unified China, but was implemented through an incredibly brutal legalist consolidation of power and proved to be very short-lived. And a model that many scholars at the time felt was a mistake. Or should the Han replicate the pre-imperial Zhou era of a decentralized government, allowing for various vassal states to still practice their own localized forms of government, culture, traditions. So the Han gave birth to a third model that incorporated both, the unification of a single commandery imperial system, but dividing over two thirds of the empire into regional kingdoms, tributary states. And Bad's astrology formed in tandem with this new model of empire, drawing from the various occult practices of these subsidiary states, their various ethnic and tribal peoples, whose primary belief system was animism, applied through the practice of shamanism. So I'm going to just give a very brief summation of animism here. The animist perspective does not say that the world is made up of things that are alive and things that are dead. Now from the animist view, all things are animate. And what makes for this animation is time. So the house that I am living in has a lifespan. It was built at one time. It's slowly deteriorating as we speak. And one day it will return to the earth. The rocks, every stone has a lifespan, even longer one. So animation is not a privileged condition. It's not reserved for some kind of specialized intelligence. 
but belongs to all. Because everything is subject to change and transformation. So the only meaningful difference between me and the door behind me is time. This door was once a tree. And when I die, my body will eventually be food for the microbes in the soil. The soil will one day feed a tree. And this tree will one day be milled into a door. So everything is connected in relationship to one another through time. Time is what puts us in relations. We are related through time. So this is the worldview that produced the vision of the five elements. What I was just describing is you know, the production creation cycle, the wood producing fire, producing earth, you know, so on and so forth. And we're not describing matter and stuff in the Platonian notion of elements. We are describing phases of time and paths of transformation. So animism does not presuppose the world already exists. The world is being created and is emerging through and in between all things, all of whom are agents of change. And the shaman who is the practitioner of animism is one who moves freely through time, moves freely between the realms and the relationships described through the, this tripartite of heaven, human, and earth, tian di ren. Shamanism is the practice that includes both healing and divination. Illness from the animist view can be seen as a time disorder. Disease is inherited from ancestors or produced from a disharmony with ancestors. Illness also caused by being out of alignment with the times, living out of sync or beyond your current circumstances, or being stuck, reliving the past, or rushing to the future. These result in disordered living, in disease. And shamanism is also the practice of divination, and the question of what time is it? By asking what time it is, we also see how things are interrelated. So whether it's oracle bones, coins, yarrow stalks, tea leaves, these can all provide insight into our timing because of our interrelations, our sharing in a call and response. The divination works through the medium of chance the medium through which events flow, bringing together seemingly disparate things in order to reveal their interrelationship. The foundational structure of Chinese astrology is the 10 heavenly stems and 12 earthly branches, what we call Tian Gan Di Zhi, otherwise known as the elements and the animals. And combined, they produce this cycle of 60, which is just another further breakdown of units of time. And we can see the influence of the animist tradition through these Bronze Era remnants. For instance, in current modern day Sichuan at the Sanxingdui burial, burial site. This dates back to before the 12th century BCE. This is a bronze tree that was excavated showing Ganzi, the stems and branches, the tree of life. There are three sections to this tree signaling that tripartite relationship of Tian Di Ren. There are 10 birds representing the 10 heavenly stems of the solar cycle. There are 12 fruits of this tree representing the 12 branches or 12 moons. 
Another early example of the calendar before it was formalized into the imperial system comes from the southern state of Chu, which is the state of Lao Tzu's birth, hence the cultural landscape that also produced Taoism. This image is called the Chu Silk Manuscript and dates to about 300 BC. It was obtained from a tomb near modern Hunan. It's an occult text showing 12 figures that personify the 12 moons of the lunar calendar. It instructs the reader on the appropriate sacrifices and acts to be performed in accordance with the gods of the calendrical periods. And these 12 figures correspond to depictions of shamans, shamans from the San Hai Jing. These include creatures of multiple heads with human faces, figures grasping snakes, snakes with multiple bodies. And so hybrid forms have a very long history in China. And the proliferation of these composite forms was especially heightened in the later Zhou dynasty. And hybridity was the cultural logic of the age and was also the model for the feudal state. The state was seen as a strange creature at the core with many additional features. This strangeness was the result of an aggregation of elements rather than a synthesis. So it's not a vision of a melting pot, nor does it have a trajectory towards some eventual improvement or progress. Now, the strongest states expanded through pure multiplicity, you know, piecemeal conquest of alien territories that were not peaceful, mind you, but were added like a hybrid creature. You know, a basic body with all these add-on features and appendages. And many local cultures continue to maintain their idiosyncratic practices, you know, adding to the strangeness of the core body. So a state becomes more powerful by becoming more and more strange through annexing a multiplicity of its neighbors. So there's a complex sense of coexisting identities. And the hybrid nature of the feudal state resulting in this cultural pluralism also corresponds to the development of Chinese writing. You know, graphs are composite forms. By adding semantic phonetic radicals, we get these multi-bodied graphs. So, the early Chinese worldview was very much informed by a vision of hybridity and pluralism. This is the vision for nature as well as our inner natures for all the landscapes outside and within. Now, hybridity is the view of the state body, the social body, the family body, and the natal body. But when we look at our natal charts, in the system of Bazi of eight characters, these various elements and animals, we see a vision mm -hmm. of the multiplicity of what we are. We are hybrid, we are compound. Now this is our nature. We are hybrid beings, meaning we are not here to perfect one quality over another. We are never one. We are yin yang, which means we are at least two things playing with each other. And this multiplicity means that nothing is left out. 
So when you see through to what we are, we are compassionate and greedy. We are selfish and generous. We can be cruel, we can be altruistic, we are aggressive, we are gentle. We are all various forms at various times and back and forth every day, all of us. This is what it means to be a human being. We are not that great, but we're not that bad either. <laughs> and hypocrisy is selectively remembering your saintliness, your godliness. Hybridity is the truth of our experience. And truth is not a principle that needs to be believed, meaning this is simply found in our everyday experience. Now, our wisdom traditions do not put much emphasis <clears throat> on belief. If you only have deities as your model, if you're only striving for the God realms, then you have to play make-believe, you know, which is investing in the illusion of your saintliness, which means you know, not being human, but being a God. And we don't have to believe in our plural nature we can just observe how we are. We are both predator and prey. Everything eats. Life is eating away at you every second. And life also gives everything to you. We are sustained by water that just falls from the sky. So you are a thief. You take resources every day and you are also being taken. You are food for the worms, the microbes, the virome, and there's no beginning or end to this. Being plural also means we exist in multiple states, multiple realms. We are not um, even awake for a good portion of our existence. A third of our lives are spent unconscious, sleeping, and nobody knows where we go when we dream. Yet, we all have this shared understanding, you know, that at the breakfast table, where nobody questions that, you know, you flew to Egypt and swam with purple elephants in the Nile. You know, our composite nature presents to us an opportunity to examine our biases. Do you privilege your waking life or your dreaming life? How do you practice dream interpretation? You know, are you mining for symbols and messages for, you know, how do I use my dreams to better serve my waking life? You know, are you analyzing your dreams for waking life optimization? Taoists have posited, hey, maybe the only reason we're awake is so we can be better dreamers. So embracing of hybridity means we have to be very inclusive. We also embrace the strange. Now, if we are to boil the two totems down of dragon and snake, you could say the dragon represents the hybrid and the snake represents the strange. And the snake or the dragon is the image of hybridity and plurality. You've got horns of a deer, the talons of an eagle, the snout of a lizard, the scales of a fish. The snake, let me share my screen again. The snake, uh, original character for the snake, she, over time became the character for other, it. Later, the warm radical was added to the character for other to make the contemporary character, she, snake. And so 
the snake, the root of the snake is the sense of otherness, that which cannot be identified, doesn't belong. It's a question mark. It's the strange. There is a great discourse on the concept of the strange from the classic of mountains and seas, the San Haijing, referred to as the Chinese bestiary. The Taoist scholar Guo Pu wrote in his commentary of the text that a thing is not strange in itself. It's up to me to make it strange. It is from this me that strangeness results. It is not that the thing is fundamentally strange. So strangeness invites us to into discourse with our internal and external landscapes. Confronting the strange has a mirror-like quality. It reveals to us the inherent strangeness of our own being. There is a absurdity to basic existence, which we all share in. Now, at the bottom of our reality is something that can't be made sense of. And we all have a kinship with this lack of sense. Now, in this tradition, the worldly and the sacred are not two separate paths. In the Sang Hai Jing, things possessing anomalous forms are also those born with divine natures. The view of things outside the norm, what we might call defects or disordered, also possess supernatural qualities. And snakes became the signifier of this. Um, oh, I meant to continue to share my screen actually and, and show you that there are many depictions, numbers of gods and divine shamans that are described as grasping snakes, wearing snakes through their ears, treading on snakes, snakes wrapped around their bodies. So snakes are really a signifier of this supernatural outside of the norm reality. And we all have a mysterious side to us. The snake is mystery itself. Our existence is fundamentally strange, absurd, and we all have an unknowable quality. But the snake is the ultimate other, is the shadow, the beast, the monster. It is what is denied existence, is exiled. And yet it is invited into the zodiac. In the 12 iterations of change, there is a space for the unplaceable, for the not being. The sequence of the zodiac is a call and response, it's an alternation of yin and yang, a shuffling of forwards and backwards. So the dragon is all things, all possibilities. The snake is no thing the state outside of all states. It's mystery itself. And it cannot be dragged into the light. It cannot be forced into the waking life. It is the unconditioned. So here's my disclaimer regarding the theme of dragon to snake. I really don't know what I'm talking about. Meaning I'm attempting to talk about what cannot be known. So the invitation here is to wonder, 
the dragon and the snake are the two zodiac animals that can take us closest to I don't know. They dance and retreat into the fringes and frays of what can be known. They are the hardest to talk about because we don't know where they come from and where they're going. The dragon isn't from here. The snake is exiled. We can't ever know what truly motivates them. But in the Zodiac, we have a place for those who don't belong and even those not interested in belonging. You know, any attempts to pin them down, you will inevitably lose them. And the dragon is so big, has no head or tail, no beginning or end, and is constantly transforming. So we can't ever figure it out. The snake is so strange and ephemeral, we can't ever find it. So the transition from dragon to snake is an invitation to mystery. The snake only gets more mysterious the more you try to understand it. It has an undoing quality, a dismantling ability. Its very nature is ungraspable. It is unnameable. It is the wordless teaching. We are not only going from dragon to snake, but also yang wood to yin wood. Yang wood brings the fresh yang energy of springtime, like dawn, sunrise, everything has been emerging into the light. Optimism has been available this dragon year, along with hope, inspiration, expectation. Clarity, confidence in your aspirations. And I really hope you have been taking advantage of this time of illumination because in the year of the snake, the lights will go out. So get a lay of the land while you can still see everything. Find your role, your path within your larger community. Understand your relationships to the people around you, to the land that you're on. Get oriented. See how everything connects and relates in this larger dragon body. And see yourself within that wide aerial dragon view from above. And try not to get overwhelmed, too overwhelmed while you're up there. Use the dragon's awesome power of visioning to understand yourself within a larger context. And hold on to that map of the universe because in the snake year, we will all be navigating in the dark. We enter the realm of the inaccessible, indecipherable, the unknowable snake. And the wood quality is also associated with wind, with permeating movement. When this movement is coupled with dragon, it becomes very drastic, very extreme. When coupled with the snake, it's very sudden, very fast. So what both the dragon and the snake share is a sense of uh, what the hell just happened? <laughs> you know, if you're currently reeling from what hit you this year, I'm sorry, it's not going to get more straightforward. <laughs> we will all be swimming in a sense of nobody saw it coming. So the emotional tone is going from being overwhelmed by the dragon to getting ambushed by the snake. Now the dragon is big young, it's the magician, the smoke and mirror show, the snake is ultimate yin, the mystic coiling inwards, the disappearing act. 
Yeah, so another thing they have in common is actually their scale. You, know, you can image the wood dragon as a thunderstorm, a lightning bolt striking down, which opens up a crevasse, a deep and bottomless pit, a void. And that would be the snake. So there is an inversion of proportionate scale. The dragon is externalizing, manifesting of the world. And the snake turns downward, underground, hidden, is not of this world. And the snake turns wood subterranean, meaning inside this dark sinkhole is where wood rots and composts. It's where we find a mycelial system that is completely invisible, but is the network underneath nourishing and sustaining everything, of which the prerequisite is a collapse, a dying, a falling apart and emptying out. So there is a great disillusion quality to the snake dissolving into emptiness. Snakes are very connected to the state of emptiness. And that emptiness quality means snakes are not even that interested in their own existence. You know, identity, social definitions are becoming meaningless. This emptiness puts you in a state of unity where there are no distinctions between good and bad, no preferences, no biases. The one way the dragon shows us our hybrid nature is by taking things to their very extreme. You know, this and that can get very polarized, totalizing, becoming only this or that. So our preferences get very stimulated in dragon year. I prefer to be good, not bad. I prefer to remember, not to forget. I prefer freedom to discipline. And my waking life is the only real one. I'd rather be alive than dead. Snakes, their response to that is, these are all part of the same continuum. Now, if you don't see how freedom and discipline are related, then you don't understand either one. You are not born already complete and your death is not the end. So emptiness has this transparent quality, the ability to see through it all. And with this emptiness quality, it's very hard to be interested in family life, career, romantic relationships, or your own identity. When snakes take on identity, it's usually for two reasons. One, it's to practice their hypnotism, their capacity to put you in a trance. You know, I am whoever you think I am. And they get to pull the strings on that. And the other reason is to hide. Putting on conventional masks, adopting traditional markers for success. And snakes love hiding in plain sight. If you force them to explain themselves or disclose themselves, this is very painful for the snake. They can also lie beautifully, so you won't ever really know anyways. The 12 animals of the zodiac are, are 12 appetites that we all have and we all cycle through. Now, some years you gorge, and some years you fast. And we all have an appetite for mysticism. It's not reserved for some elite priest or goddess class. It's not reserved only for the initiated. We all have a snake appetite. 
we have the other inside of us, the unknown, the mystic, the monster. In previous snake years, 9-11 occurred. The Boston Marathon bombing happened. The last wood snake year was 1969. That was the year Malcolm X was assassinated. Bloody Sunday happened in Selma. The Watts riots began in LA. And the first LSD tests were conducted in San Francisco. So there's a little tasting for you. Whether it's a bullet or an acid tab, the snake shows us that small things can do enormous things. They can open up worlds or destroy them. And usually doing both at the same time. The chaos that the snake can create is very far reaching because the way that small takes over big is by acting very fast. Usually when you're big, you're kind of slow. The snake can hide in total stillness and then ambush. It's capable of striking when people least expect it. And if you are very precise and very fast, you don't actually have to be that strong. And if you have venom to back up your sudden blow, then you can take big down very easily. Snakes are not afraid of going dark, of having a negative outlook, of getting nihilistic. And they are venom as medicine, the poison as the cure. From the snake bite, we cross over to death, which means we get to return to the unknowable root, the source. Snakes have also the capacity for sudden revelation, primordial insight, complete awakening, miraculous healing. This transparency nature of the snake, that mirror-like quality, means that all situations next year will show you what you really are. So everybody is getting a little naked next year. Everything you try to externalize will most likely collapse backwards and inwards. You know, this is the great inversion. Mountains will become sinkholes. Now, this means that whether or not you succeed or fail in your endeavors next year, the end result will be your own revelation. So if all you want is a million followers on TikTok and to receive a million dollar promotion, you might get it because revelation can come in very sneaky ways. The moment you gain your fame and ri riches, you will be immediately dissatisfied. All you will feel is your bottomless hunger, your void. Meaning becoming rich and famous in a snake year will be the same outcome as not getting rich and famous in a snake year. You will be profoundly unfulfilled. <laughs> now, all situations will have this transparent nature. So there's actually great potential for reflection, for maturity, for awakening, for ripening. And the snake, you know, what it does is it puts us into a kind of bardo state, being in between realms, in the liminal space. The bardo is where both revelation and illusion can occur. Now, both will become more available next year. Meaning the chances of miscalculating are very high. And having that wood quality means we can get easily wrapped up 
in the fantasy of springtime, of praying to the tyranny of the dawn. You know, in California, we have a very special brand of possibilitarianism, you know, getting drunk off of fantasy. And this will be heightened in the spring of 2025. Revelation will be more available in the fall during the metal months. But in general, the illusion, the dream is more available than ever in a wood snake year. It will reveal to us our own willingness to be seduced, to offer ourselves up for possession and the extremes we will go to get it. We all think we are warriors for truth. Nothing is more seductive than the search for truth, especially when we believe we've arrived at it. Everything I say today is true and also the opposite of everything I say is true. The only difference is timing. The Chinese wisdom traditions are not that concerned with truth, only timing and appropriateness. The snake teaching is all statements are operating from false certainties. So next year, you can also fall into a kind of everything is true because the snake's Nihilism can get turned very childlike, which is this wood, youthful, young quality. We're dealing with a baby snake here. So it can be like, nothing matters, there's no truth, anything can be real if you just believe in it. So cults, conspiracies, magical thinking, false prophets, government cover-ups, and the promise of panaceas, and snake oil salesmen. Now, we can all easily get put under their spell. We can get easily pulled into a trance. Also, the sense of the strange of not belonging can turn very easily into an Elon Muskian space expansionism and space colonization perpetuated by a sort of transhumanist belief of not really belonging here. So we must colonize as much of our future light cone as possible. And this is all for the sake of continuing the human race. And we're saving the future of the species by getting out of here. And this kind of escapism will be very seductive in the snake year. It's very sneaky. So we need to all ask ourselves, what is driving us forward? And then try to see through it. Now, there's a yin aggression that will be at an all time high. Yin aggression says, we can do what we want because we're actually saving the world. We cannot limit ourselves if we're engineering solutions. And the sense of ap apocalypticism will be rampant. The despair of the end times being imminent, which is just the religious belief of Jesuits repackaged into modern day salvationism. There is no solution big enough to solve the problem of the world. So we are all waiting for a savior. This is very disempowering. It's how we end up with all of our false leaders. Because saviors feed off of our addiction to disorder. We are swimming in a culture and political climate that fetishizes the end times. We are just breeding despair and it's very disempowering. It will also be very seductive to go to the other end of dualism, which would be the complete denial of our current condition. 
remember if you get lost, if you feel lost in the snake year, you can always do your own divining and ask, what time is it? Where are we in the circle, in the cycle of time? And we are in civilization collapse. We are living in a time of poly crises, of multiple intersecting emergencies. So the tremendous compounded loss we are experiencing in the world has no single solution. There are no saviors, no easy answers. And in the snake year, we can actually be with the collapse, be with the fall. What time is it? Not the time of expansion. We are downsizing. In the descent, we are sloughing off. We are in the parting, the loss, subtraction. Let us be where we actually are. What is rotting and composting in the sinkhole, in the snake pit? Next year, you can help us all by being a digester, not a creator meaning to not go straight to fixing the problems. Don't try to save us. The solutionists are how we arrived at the problem of civilization. This world as we know it is already dying. That's the definition of unsustainable. It's being outpaced by its own greed. It's already being crushed by its own voraciousness. You can't save it, and you also don't have to go out and create its end. And I'm going to try to wrap us up here. <laughs> you know, there's many big thoughts, many big things I've just said. But what I can really leave you with is that in a snake year, we can try to see through the events that brought us here. So in my New Year's tea time last year, I talked about the potential for the revival of religious wars in a dragon year. These wars are calling on the highest power to hijack power. But this is what God wants us to do. God is making us do it. The dragon is calling for these new regimes. And that sequence of dragon to snake represents strong karmic retribution. If you use dragon's vision to see from above, you see that there is no beginning or end to the events of retribution. If you can see through this stream of time, you can see how these cycles are only perpetuated through our polarization. You know, through zooming out with dragon's vision and with snake's sense of transparency, we can see through any conflict, not in a way of identifying which side of the conflict we're on, but seeing the dynamic of polarization that we're engaged in. You know, in my dragon forecast last year, I asked, how do we, do we respond to the world in a way that doesn't reinforce the very thing we try to challenge? And so reluctance, be a little reluctant to get pulled in. Reluctance is a quality that will actually be available in the snake year. Now, in any dynamic of dualism where we believe we have arrived at the truth, we will often act in the opposite direction of our beliefs to protect it. And we see this again and again in history. So the dragon year is an opportunity to embrace the diversity and hybridity of the larger body, 
and acknowledge the limitations of any single perspective. Polarity will continue to seduce us into outrage. We will, it will result in seeing the world from dualistic terms, which leaves no room for other stories. The snake year is about inviting the other in, those you've deemed other, other narratives, other realms. Get to wondering, move towards mystery, be the question mark. Invite the strange and acknowledge your own strangeness, your own hybrid nature, which is to say embracing your humanity. That the ancient wisdom traditions have a lot to offer us at this time because they have a very deep memory. They have survived many genocides, many apocalypses, and so can offer us this broadening of our view. I don't know, Sam, if this is the all we have time for today. I can just keep going on and on, but I also want to give people an opportunity to ask questions. Yeah, I mean, you're our last speaker for today. Um, so I really don't want to cut you off if you have a few more things to say. Um, and then, you know, after that, we can go into question and answer. Yeah, yeah I'm, I'm happy to you know, engage with folks now. Um, and, you know, as we receive questions, I'm sure we'll, we can dive deeper in certain areas too. Yeah, that sounds mm -hmm. awesome. As, as we go in this conference, um, be sure to put your uh, question in the chat and I'll, I'll read it out to keep things smooth. I found myself chuckling a lot during that talk because um, it's so interesting how the dragon year sets us up for a lot of the things that you're talking about. Like this grand chain, these big, large, kind of higher level things lead the way to like not taking care of the fine details and, and putting ourselves in a position where we're likely to get ambushed or surprised by something because we focused on such large concepts for a little while. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. You know, that concept of the setup is very important, right? The sequencing is not random. It's very purposeful. You know, what one leaves us with is the setup for the next, which can be good, can be bad. You know, if you're, you're really killing it this year, just wait. <laughs> if you think you're really blowing it, just wait. Now, this is the alternation of time of yin and yang. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I have a question in the chat here. Thank you for sharing your thought-provoking presentation. We have a lot of thinking to do. That's true. That's my addition. Uh, you paint a pessimistic view of the year of the snake, and yet it sounds to me that it also presents opportunities. For me, it all depends on how you internalize these realities. A cautionary prediction, but to prepare us to embrace the duality uh, that all is not lost. Hmm. Yeah, you know, it, it seems pessimistic to all the other 11 signs, <laughs> you know, that what characterizes every character is its relationship to the others, right? So the snake lives in mystery, lives in darkness. It's not pessimistic to the snake. It's pessimistic to everybody else. Just like the dragon lives in extreme, in expansion, in largeness. And to the dragon, it must be extreme. And it's only extreme to, you know, the all the roosters and rabbits that are cowering in a corner. <laughs> so the, in each character, if we see through them, gives us an opportunity to see the diversity of character, the diversity of power, all the flavors of our power and weaknesses that are appropriate given certain times. So in every year, there is an opportunity. If it's an auspicious year, you will feel that momentum. You can ride this chi. It's very appetizing to you. If this year is not auspicious, you should hide. 
<laughs> go duck. Find the others who are powering. You know, start a little pack there. And then auspicious and inauspicious it doesn't really mean anything. You know, there's always agency, you know, just like the elements. We are all flavoring and acting and enacting, emanating, consuming and diffusing into each other. There's always agency in the cycles of change. Yeah, that, that reminds me, I like that analogy of that cowering, that kind of like being underneath the surface this year, because, uh, you know, I, I'm just going to relate my own experience because I think it's it's goes quite in alignment with the year of the dragon where everything is happening all at once. I, I can barely make enough time for some of the smaller projects um, that I have going on because it's just I constantly have something new and giant to handle like every single day, um, whereas, you know, like actually, even if they've been good things. I'm like, I could, I could do a year where I'm just underground a little bit and just like putting together some of the small pieces that I, that I haven't had a chance to this year. Yeah. Yeah, yeah absolutely. It's a chance to exhale, right? <laughs> you know, we're not in the inhale only club, mm. right? That's never ending pushing forward. And so there is that opportunity to rest as well. And you know, this is what yin affords us to see how, you know, like that mycelial network, how our whole context, everything that surrounds us, that is supporting us. And that's what resting can afford us. And the dragon, it's the striving, that pushing forward. It's the aggressiveness too, and ambition. And you know we get this chance to alternate, to go back and forth. Yeah, I think, um, yeah, that's wonderful. I think the last question that I wanna ask is, are there times of this coming year, you mentioned kind of a difference between the energy in the spring and the fall. Are there times this coming year, uh, and, and I follow this up by, you mentioned a couple, you know, 9-11, the marathon bombing and things like that, where we should kind of lay extra low where we should really like, you know, don't go to that concert, just, you know, watch a movie at home instead sort of thing. I would be very cautious in the springtime and early summer. And again, this highlights that wood impulsivity, you know, that youthful quality of wood that is young, naive, impulsive. And this is yin wood. It's extra flexible. It's extra adaptive. It also can go from stillness and shy to striking very fast. And so it highlights some of the propensities of the snake already. So this is the time when miscalculating will be at its height. And so whether you choose to strike or to stay still, these are the two kind of opposite qualities of the snake. Whether you choose to be in your stillness or to strike is up to you during the snake year. And in that moment of wood feeding fire, you know, fire is the native element of the snake. The chances of you miscalculating when you strike are at its peak. Now this is also that energy of the small, the young, wreaking complete havoc. And this baby snake, like thinking, think of like toddlers as masters of destruction. No, it's so, so little, but oh boy, <laughs> you've ever babysat, you have a niece or nephew, you know, this is um, the potential for chaos is really great. But also we have to be careful in the fall too. We have to act in accordance with the seasons. Now, that metal energy can really heighten the cutting quality of the snake. This sharpness, this, um, if, if we don't engage in our own sloughing off, in our own release, if we haven't in our dragon year, completed the things we meant to complete. We're still carrying all the overwhelm and all the I should have and I, 
that that can really wreak havoc in the fall time when we should be engaging more in the stillness when you would be channeling your revelation you're instead sifting through endless minutia and chaos so revelation doesn't come to you 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 aren't preparing yourself for that clarity yeah thank you for that that um yeah i think you're you're giving us really nice uh not just perspectives on like what to expect from the year but also how to prepare and greet it which i think is probably one of the best gifts that astrology can give us is is to how to how to best invite this guest into our home um yeah i think let's see uh we have a comment here amazing uh much thanks it was charming and very very helpful more than simple divination is a wire for our future. And I imagine that this is just a little part, uh, but enough. Yeah. Awesome. Um, yeah. If you have anything more to say, I'm not going to cut you off for sure, but um, you know, I want to be respectful of your time. And so thank you for taking us through this because actually I'm, I'm listening to what you say. I'm like, Oh yeah, everything is kind of set up for exactly these scenarios. So uh, we kind of need to prepare it and to watch over the rest of the year. And luckily, we have this talk right now at a time where we can actually take care of some things. Um, the end of this dragon year. Yeah, we are coming close to the end of a cycle, which means we can be prescient about what's to come. So I thank everybody for being here. Thank you, Sam, for hosting. It's been a real pleasure to be with everybody and blessings for the transition from dragon to snake so i just want to um sam maybe you want to read um pa powell's uh uh actually message which is really awesome i, oh, I, I, I yeah, missed yeah, it yeah, yeah thank you able to hear this right yeah, yeah thank you no uh, that's lovely uh Powell asked or said thank you it's a truly fascinating lecture i have no particular question and it's definitely not a critique but i personally sometimes have troubles accepting such yearly generalizations, even despite the civilization or culture being more global now than the past, the planet is still very diverse. How can I know these predictions are valid to the place I live? You mentioned some important happenings from 1965, but they were all just in the US, and that year was very different in different parts of the world. Also, sometimes it may seem that such big energetic cyclical movements only influence humans, but do they also apply, for example, the populations of whales, ants, or gorillas? With a wink. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Was it Pablo was the name? Paul, I think. Oh, Sorry. Thank you so much for your question and for helping expand our view to beyond the anthropocentric perspective, right? You know, that in Gwen Duen, in the circle, there's not just humans here. In the animist worldview, we are in kinship with all things. And when we do these yearly forecasts, you know, we are taking a very specific and actually kind of small aspect of Chinese astrology, and we're stretching it very, very big, right? There's many other aspects to this modality and specificities too, right? That you know, depending on your character, depending on your natal chart, depending on where you live, depending on your locality, your climate, this will all sift and settle in different ways. So that's very important to acknowledge. I think without, because I can take this in so many different directions and we can start diving into minutia, but I think where I would take this is that the trajectory of dragon to snake is also the trajectory of the worldly chi becoming internal, going down to a more personal level. So there, we are going to have our personal experiences of the snake year. And they provide, the diversity of what we may experience provides a certain kind of opportunity because of the snake character. So you may experience, for instance, 
a profound loss in the snake year, a loss that shatters you, that you feel incapable of experiencing. And that sense of loss will lead you to your awakening. Or it can lead you to psychosis. And this is a snake. Now, both are available. And so when we try to distill what this means for us, now, through that lens of transparency, you may be coming to a crossroads in your life you know, where you, uh, you know, don't know whether to, do I do this or do I do that? And the snake answer is, don't do either. And then you might go, well, I might lose my job. I might lose my house. And the snake says, let it go. You keep going in that direction. That's where all the chi is next year. And this, it's all coming from this withdrawal. And so th that's a little bit of like the flavor. You know, whether that digests well for you or not is up to your specificity, your you know, positionality. But that's you know, one way we can pull some threads into the personal. I hope that lands. Maybe it's easier to digest in a, in a snake year than a dragon year. If I'm understanding what you're saying, right? <laughs> yeah, depending on who you are. Yes. Yeah, wonderful. Um, yeah, thank you so much for this talk. Uh, really, I think like whether you, yeah, wherever you sit on the spectrum uh, for this dragon year, it's good to kind of have an idea of, of our past. Uh, the examples you gave are really helpful to kind of think about what actually might happen this year and what to prepare for. And, and from one day to another, I was in Boston for the Boston Marathon bombing, you know, like a couple blocks from where it happened. And I remember, yeah, you woke up that morning, like it's a very normal day. And then, you know, all of a sudden you got to stay in your, your house for, for a couple of weeks. Um, so that's the sort of characteristic of, of the snake, right? So just keeping in mind to have a, have a plan B. Um, but yeah, thank you for being here. You already, we already kind of outroed. Um, but yeah, I don't know if Joshua is still here and wants to say anything. Um, and if not, oh, I'm here. It's great, great, what? and nice to meet you. It's a very amazing um uh, presentation, and you know, I I believe a lot of people learn a lot. In the Chinese culture, they have a lot of how to say a lot of way of a lot of method. You know, do the astrology or the de de divination and something like that. It's a lot, a lot of different way. So either I don't know, it's maybe um, it's kind of like you talking the way. It's more a little bit like a combat with the waste. You know, it's 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 great. A little bit of combat with the waste is astrology. It's 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 amazing. So for me, it's a little bit new. Uh, it's 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 great. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Awesome. Well, we're going to, again, say thank you to Meng and our speakers from today. Uh, these recordings will be up and available if you're like, I heard something amazing and I want to go back and listen to it again, or I want to share it with a friend. It will be on YouTube within a week or two. And um, we're going to start back up tomorrow with another day of talks at 9 a.m. Eastern. Uh, yeah, tomorrow, Sunday. So thank you for the folks who have been here for one or more talks. And um Thanks for the folks that are speaking and making it happen. And we'll see you soon, if you can. Goodbye, everyone. Thank you. All right. Thank you, everybody.